Hi. Hi. Welcome to our podcast. Hopefully welcome back. Yes, please. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And I'm going to just start off with telling you about my dream. (laughs) (laughs) Are you excited? We're only giggling because we literally had to like kick multiple cats out of our little recording studio here. (laughs) We've had quite the cat debacle over here. I think uh, we finally are safe, yeah. though. We'll see. Probably not. We'll have to stop again and fix that. That's probably true. Um, But here we are. So I've been watching these videos on YouTube, and it's like where these girls put their hoods up. And eat pickles? No, they're not. <laughs> they put their hoods up on their sweatshirts, and they're, like, hiding their hair, and they slowly pull it backwards and it's like you kind of have to guess if they're going to be bald or if their hairline is just really far back. What? I don't know. I watched a lot of these. But either way, for some reason, then I went and what had a dream. What do you do with your life? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I had a dream that I, like, went to the bar and my hair fell off. <laughs> and I was bald and had, like, this little tuft of hair in the front where your bangs are and nothing else that is amazing (laughs) yeah (laughs) i mean like this is a great mental image i'm having right now i can't i didn't love it i was freaking out i love it (laughs) and then i was like running away from everybody because my hair fell off (laughs) (laughs) wow um wow (laughs) Uh huh. That's an unfortunate dream. It was. Um, and then I had a really crazy week. I went and bought a sound booth. That's true. We are currently in it. Yeah, the cats love it. They uh, hang out in the sound booth. It's nice and toasty in here. I can tell you that much. I like it. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I am not enjoying it. And okay, so when I went to pick up the sound booth. Uh, The guy asked me what I was getting it for. And so I was like, oh, yeah, I just started a podcast. And he's like, cool, what's it about? And I said, true crime. He goes, are you a murderino? I was like, yes, I am. Yes. What the hell? (laughs) Yeah, it was super cool. And so then we were talking about different podcasts. And I told him about ours. And he was like, okay, I'll look it up. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. So that was a really fun experience. And then I thought, well, since I've already spent the money on a sound booth, I probably need two guitars, even though I don't even play guitar yet. (laughs) (laughs) So I went to uh, Prince Music Company in Roseville and picked up two electric guitars. Hey. And then... (laughs) um, Jeez. I know. Listen, this has been a week. Uh, then I was telling people about my guitars and my awesome friend Mitch was like, well, guess what? I've got an amp. So he brought me amp and flowers. What the hell? I know. (laughs) Take notes, people. Take notes. It was so sweet. And then he got to meet Frankenstein. (laughs) Oh, Frankie. (laughs) Yeah. Did he tell him a story? Um, no, he laid there all perfectly good, and I was like, this is not what he normally does. He's like, oh, we have visitors, I need to pretend. (laughs) I've got to. Yeah, Mitch was like, oh, you're so sweet, look at that, he's so nice. And (laughs) I was like, so "Mm." sweet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and then Monster laid next to Frankie, and Mitch was like, "Mm, twinning. Oh my goodness. (laughs) My cat just tried to dig me out of here a few minutes ago. He saw me walk in here, and so he got very salty and was sitting outside of the booth and digging on the walls, trying to dig me out. Yeah, we're like, who's (laughs) banging on the door? (laughs) Yeah, that would be my 23-pound giant floof ball of a cat. Yes. (laughs) Trying to rescue mom. It would indeed. I was like, listen, if I'm giving her a timeout, you're just going to have to deal with it. It's true. But speaking of cats, I definitely had a dream the other night that (laughs) it was a really wonderful dream. I don't say that often, but it was great. Mm. Isaac, he sent me to, well, there's actually two. So the first one is he sent me and Megan to the grocery store. So we ended up buying um, four carts 
literally full to the top of pickles. Yes! <laughs> and honestly, it's really like not, not that off mark. You know, we probably really would do that. All the pickles. <laughs> but it was just a great dream because I just remember being like, oh my goodness, I have four entire carts of pickles. Like, this is the best day ever. Mm -hmm. And then I actually had a dream the same night that um, I had found a kitten on the road and I was bringing it home and Isaac showed up at the house and brought me a puppy. <laughs> it was honestly like the best two dreams I've ever had, to be honest. I mean, I got a kitten, a puppy and pickles. Pickles. I mean, literally, what more can I ask for? Tacos. That's good point. Damn. <laughs> I want tacos. Way to and rain on my parade, dude. <laughs> well, you asked. God. Uh, and that would make it better. How rude. But it sounded really great. It did sound great, didn't it? Yes. <laughs> that would be amazing. Mm hmm. But, Speaking of great. Oh, dear. I'm so pumped for our story today. Are you? Yes, I am. This so, is a really good one. It's so good. Do you have anything else to talk about? Uh. <laughs> well, I guess not. I mean, you can if you want to, but no, I really no. want to get to our story. Go ahead. Okay, today's story is about... Are you ready? I don't know. Am I? The Purple Gang from Michigan. Yes! <laughs> oh my goodness, I've been so excited for this one. Yeah, I seriously had so much fun researching this one. Um, this is going to be a great history lesson, but seriously, you're going to have so much fun with this one. I am so excited. I don't know much about this one. I just happened to see a little bit on it, but I had never even heard of this and I am shocked that I hadn't. Same. And I actually texted like four different friends and just asked them casually, like, Hey, have you ever heard of the purple gang? And all of them said, no. But, like, with all the details, I was so shocked that nobody's heard of this. I mean, I, I didn't even hear the details yet, and I was, like, shocked that, you know, I had never heard about it just by seeing, like, the people that were involved and whatnot. Yeah. So, I guess. All right. Buckle up. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, in 1920, Prohibition took effect throughout the United States, which was a gift to organized crime. In Canada, the port city of Windsor, Ontario directly across the Detroit River, became a major place for smuggling alcohol into the U.S. The Canadian government had also banned the use of alcoholic beverages. Oh, you'd be out. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> you are so right. Mm -hmm. But still approved and licensed distilleries and breweries to manufacture and export alcohol. Detroit's immigrant neighborhoods were suffering from widespread poverty, along with many other major cities in the 20th century. Some people turned to crime for survival, and they enforced it with violence. The Hastings Street neighborhood in Detroit's Lower East Side was known as Paradise Valley. Several of the Purple Gang's core members went to Bishop School and had been placed in the Problem Children Division. Why you look at me like that? Because you'd be in that division Are you trying too. You place me in the problem, children. <laughs> you place yourself in there. Freaking, you're not very nice today. <laughs> I'm truthful. God. Uh, no, <laughs> fuck you. You're being very rude to me today, and I don't appreciate it. You're fine. <gasps> Keep going, you big bully. <sighs> Most of the members were American-born children of Jewish immigrants primarily from Russia and Poland, who had come to the United States in the Great Immigration Wave from 1881 to 1914. The leaders of the gang were brothers Abe, Joe, Raymond, and Izzy Bernstein, and they had moved to Detroit from New York City. The Purple Gang, also known as the Sugar House Gang, started off as petty thieves and extortionists, but quickly moved to arm robbery and truck hijacking. They were the only Jewish gang to ever dominate the underworld in a major American city. At their height, they had about 50 members, but they had power and influence over the city and were even able to bribe the Detroit Police Department. Oh, that's nice. Right? They were known for being savage, and they would take gangsters from other cities to work as muscle for their gang. There are so many theories as to the origin of the name Purple Gang, 
One of the members of the gang was a boxer who wore purple shorts during his fights, and some people believe that's where the name came from. Another version is that the name came from a conversation between two shopkeepers who said, These boys are not like other children of their age. They're tainted, off color. The other shopkeeper replied, Yes, they're rotten, purple like the color of bad meat. They're a purple gang. Oh. <laughs> They were also mentored by Sammy Purple Cohen, and it's believed that the police started calling them Purple's Gang. This gang may not have had a terrifying name. That one makes the most sense to me, to be honest. The police one? Yeah, because, like... Uh, Yeah, I know, like, who hears the shopkeepers talking about this? I have no idea. (laughs) Yeah, so they were probably Purple's Gang, but either way... It's, it's not a terrifying name, but they became hijackers and gained a reputation for stealing alcohol cargoes from older and more established criminal gangs. Chicago gangster Al Capone was against expanding his business in Detroit, so he began working with the Purple Gang and using them rather than fighting them. Oh, this is part of why I was so excited about this. I know. Al Capone, I think I even said it with a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Uh, For several years, the gang supplied Canadian whiskey to the Capone organization in Chicago. The gang was also involved in kidnapping other gangsters for ransom, and the FBI believes they were involved in the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. What? Yeah. And I'm going to give you an overview of this. What? That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. So on March 1st, 1932... Charles Lindbergh Jr., the 20-month-old son of aviation hero Charles Lindbergh, was kidnapped from the family's mansion in Hopewell, New Jersey. Charles and his wife, Anne, found a ransom note in their son's empty room that demanded uh, $50,000. The kidnapper used a ladder to climb up to the second-floor window and left muddy footprints in the room. Al Capone, who was in prison at the time, even offered to help find the missing child. Three days later, a new letter showed up, demanding $70,000. The money was delivered, and the Lindberghs were told their baby was on a boat called Nellie off the coast of Massachusetts. Soon after, the baby's body was discovered near the Lindbergh mansion. He had been killed the night of the kidnapping and was found less than a mile from the home. The Lindberghs ended up donating the mansion to charity and moved away. In September 1934, a marked bill from the ransom turned up. The gas station attendant wrote the license plate number down because the customer was acting so suspicious. It was tracked back to a German immigrant, Bruno Hopman, who claimed a friend gave him the money and he had no connection to the crime. By the late 1920s, the Purple Gang reigned over the Detroit underworld, controlling the city's gambling, liquor, and drug trade. There were more than 25,000 illegal speakeasies in the city, and most Holy were shit. controlled, right? That's a lot. A huge amount, and most were controlled by the gang. They even ran the local wire service, providing a horse race information to local horse betting parlors. The gang members began branching out into other cities, working with infamous mobsters and hijacked prize fight films and forced theaters to show them for a high fee. What? Uh Uh-huh. They were busy. Clearly. They even defrauded insurance companies by staging fake accidents. During the 20s, the gang had a feud with Joseph Kennedy. And let me just tell you, I was actively cheering... In the basement when I was researching this and found out that a Kennedy's name popped up because I love that the Kennedys are somehow involved in everything. (laughs) They really are, too. It gets me so pumped. So here we are. Okay. So the gang had a feud with Joseph Kennedy, father of the future president. During Prohibition, Kennedy was smuggling liquor through Canada, which he was purchasing from England and Ireland. He ended up shipping liquor through the Purple Gang's turf without their permission. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-huh. They don't like that. So the gang put a hit out on him. Kennedy turned to Chicago mobster Joseph Diamond Joe Esposito, who intervened and got the contract on his life lifted. As the gang grew in size, 
they began hiring themselves out as hitmen and took part in the Cleaners and Dyers War. The Purples profited from the Detroit Laundry Industry Unions and Associates. They were hired to keep union members in line and to harass non-union independents. Professional laundry companies that refused to join the union were faced with consequences, such as bombings, arson, theft, and murder. That's quite a consequence. It's, it is indeed, <laughs> yes. <laughs> In 1924, Detroit's professional laundry industry was very unstable. Competing businesses put prices too low to make a profit, and tailors didn't want to pay their cleaning bills. So they began taking their business to a different cleaner. The cleaners and dyers needed an opportunity to organize and set those pricing standards and the other uh, industry controls. They seized the opportunity to establish a cleaner's organization that used the Purple Gang to enforce the new rules by controlling prices and preventing tailors from switching to different companies. The Wholesale Cleaners and Dyers Association ended up collecting money to fund the gang's illicit activities. The money, or dues, protected the association members from the violence. Cleaners who refused to join the association were harassed. The Purples tossed stink bombs into laundry facilities, threw bricks through their windows, and often left partially burned sticks of dynamite as a warning sign. Jeez, that's nice. It's so sweet, isn't it? <laughs> In 1928, 12 members of the Purple Gang were charged with conspiracy to extort money, but they were all found not guilty. What? And they were acquitted of their charges. What? Uh-huh. How does that even work? <laughs> Because they're the purples. Holy shit. <laughs> On Christmas night, 1926, saloon keeper Johnny Reed was shot to death in his apartment building. Reed was a former member of Egan's Rats and a liquor agent for the Purple Gang. Earlier that year, Reed and several friends were involved in a shooting war with Sicilian gangster Mike DePisa. The former Rats won the fight. And it's believed that Frank Wright, a Chicago jewel thief, was the trigger man. Shortly after this murder, Frank Wright and two New York burglars, Joseph Bloom and George Cohen, began kidnapping Detroit gamblers for ransom. There's so many things happening to I it. I know. <laughs> this one was seriously so fun to I do. I mean, I'm loving it. I'm just like, holy shit, so many, like, murders, bombs, like, <laughs> kidnappings. Holy yes. crap. Mm-hmm. Uh, many of the people that were taken were connected to the Purples. The line was finally crossed on February 3rd, 1927, when the trio gunned down a Purple gang drug peddler, Jake Weinsberg. The Bernstein brothers decided to unleash associates, Burke and Winkler, to handle this situation. They went to work quickly and lured Frank Wright into the open by kidnapping his friend, Meyer Fish Bloomfield. Holy cow. <laughs> Just so much. Yeah. A ransom was agreed upon, and they made arrangements for the exchange. This was going to take place in apartment 308 of the Milliflores Apartments at 4.30 a.m. on March 28, 1927. Wright, Bloom, and Cohen arrived at the Milliflores. They knocked on the door of apartment number 308. The fire door at the end of the hallway opened. Three men opened fire with pistols and a submachine gun. Oh, wow. <sighs> All they three. They messing around. They're not. They're done. All three gangsters were hit and the trigger men escaped down a back stairway. Bloom and Cohen died at the scene. The medical examiner said they were riddled with so many bullets. He was unable to determine exactly how many times they each had been hit. Oh, yeah, that is terrifying. Holy shit. Oh, my God. I can't imagine that. The third man that was shot, Frank Wright, was still alive despite having 14 bullet wounds. When Holy he was asked... If, what? Yeah. Okay. When he was asked if he saw the killers, he said, The machine gun worked. That's all I can remember. He died the following morning. The next day... The Detroit God. police officers pulled over a car on Woodward Avenue and arrested Abe Axler and Fred Burke. 
They were both suspected for the slaughter, but neither were charged. What the shit? Do you like that? Everybody. This incident really solidified the gang's reputation, and the Purple Gang seemed to have complete immunity from police, and witnesses were too terrified to testify against them. The Purple Gang was into all sorts of mischief, obviously, (laughs) and attempted to run gambling rings in Detroit. This was run by Julius Horowitz, the son of the sugar supplier to the breweries, and a one-legged gangster wanted in the South for murder. The gamblers eventually learned that the Purples had been using loaded dice and other tricks to become more profitable. A small riot broke out, and Horowitz escaped, but the one-legged gangster believed to be killed. A war over... Believed. I mean, they didn't find a body. Oh, and man. he disappeared, so right. it's just believed. <laughs> Yeah. This is bananas. I know. This shit is bananas. B A N A N A S. <laughs> We're so stupid. <laughs> That's how I learned how to spell bananas. Thank you very much. Yikes. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a war over territory eventually erupted between the Italian, Irish, and Jewish bootleggers. The Purples were involved in this vicious war, and in 1927, three men were killed. The men had been brought into Detroit as hired assassins for the gang, and the motive for murder was believed to be retaliation for a double cross. The homicides took place in an apartment, leased by the Purple Gang members, Eddie Fletcher and Abe Axler and Fred Burke. They were, of course, questioned along with other Purples, but no one was ever convicted of the murders. Oh, imagine that. Isn't that so weird? (laughs) Another incident that took place in 1927 was the murder of a police officer, Vivian Welsh. He was later revealed to be a dirty cop that was trying to extort money from the Purples. On February 13th, 1929, Abe Bernstein called Bugs Moran to tell him that a hijacked load of booze was on its way to Chicago. Moran was in the middle of a turf war with Al Capone. And had only recently begun to trust Abe Bernstein. He knew that Abe had previously been Al Capone's chief supplier of Canadian liquor. The next day, instead of delivering the load of liquor, four men, two of which were in police uniforms, went to SMC Cartage on North Clark Street, which was Moran's hangout. They opened fire with Thompson submachine guns, killing seven men, and this was known as as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It's believed that the Purples were involved. This is why I legitimately was so, like, mind-blown that I didn't know who they were. Because right? the minute I found out they were part of, like, they could, you know, be part of that, I was just like, Megan, we have to do this. There's so much. That is not so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like we talked about earlier, the gang started out with major activity in hijacking liquor from rum runners along the Detroit River. At one point, they began smuggling liquor with a small purple gang subgroup known as Little Jewish Navy. This group trafficked liquor from Canada by boat and had three former Chicago thieves, Joe Lebowitz, Herman Jaime Paul, and Isidore Izzy the Rat Sutker. I know, they all have amazing names. <laughs> they really did. <laughs> um, and I mean, I know there's tons and tons of names that are popping up in this thing. I don't think all of the names are important to remember as long as you're picking up on, like, the pieces of the story. Because it probably is getting a little confusing. Yeah, with a lot of names. Yeah, I yeah. That. And that's what I was worried about with this one. But um, it is cool because these are some big names. <laughs> So, That's true. Yeah. I've heard a couple in there that I know. Absolutely. Uh, the trio attempted to establish independent power and called themselves the Third Avenue Terrors, and they tried to take over a piece of the Purple Gang's territory. Now, didn't we learn earlier they that don't like it? That never works. They don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Purple's leader, Ray Bernstein, decided they must be eliminated, and he cooked up a plan. I mean, what, what did they think was going to happen? Uh, they would just be handed over that little piece that they wanted. Oh, of course. It's not a big deal. Maybe. Um, 
but Ray didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> a gang associate, Saul Levine, was a good friend of both groups and was led to believe he was going to be a mediator between the gangs. He was convinced that the Purples decided to give the trio a small piece of the liquor business. The meeting was to take place September 16th, 1931. Saul Levine led the trio to an apartment on Collingwood Avenue. When they got inside the apartment, there was some general conversation that began. Bernstein left because he had to go get something from his vehicle. Once he was in his car, he honked the horn. This was the Uh signal to Harry (laughs) Keywell, (laughs) Irving Milberg, and Harry Fleischer, three Purple Gang members who remained in the apartment. Without warning, Fleischer stood up, pulled out a revolver, and shot Lebowitz at point-blank range. Milberg and Keywell began firing at the other two. Levine was untouched on orders from Bernstein. The shooters left the apartment, hopped in the car, and left. When police arrived at the scene, Levine was still there and was taken in for questioning. He admitted to seeing the murders and named the shooters. After the confession, police received an anonymous call where they stated, Two of the men you want for the Collingwood murder are at 2649 Calvert. They'll be out of town within the hour. Police arrived at the location, heavily armed, and arrested Bernstein and Keywell. The men were sitting in their pajamas, playing cards. Milberg was arrested the next night as he was leaving town. The guns were recovered, and tests proved they were the murder weapons. But did they still get away with it? (laughs) Would you like that? (laughs) No, not really, but it seems to be the freaking pattern. Okay. The trial began on November 2nd, and it only took the jury an hour and 37 minutes to return with guilty verdicts. What? Yep. Here we go. They were each sentenced to life in prison without parole. They were sent to Marquette Prison, Michigan's maximum security facility. The Collingwood Manor Massacre marked the downfall of the Purple Gang. For many years, the Purple seemed invincible and became more arrogant and sloppy as time went on. They were dressing flamboyantly, going to cities' night spots, and they were super well-known by the public. Now that their gang members were getting locked up, they were shook to the core. The convictions not only broke the back of the Purple Gang, but it served as notice to the other mobs that the police were stepping up and fighting back. Immunity was done. At this time, police were finding it easier to connect crimes to the gang as they were leaving so much evidence behind. <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> right. Let's make it it's a little they were easier getting for off you. Of everything before. <laughs> there were fights happening between the members of the gang and high ranking members, including Abe Axler, Henry Shore, and Eddie Fletcher, were killed. Axler and Fletcher were found shot to death in the back of a Chrysler in Bloomfield Hills, and this double murder remains unsolved. By 1935, more than 18 Purples had been killed by their own gang. They were losing their street muscle, and this created an opening for the Italian Mafia. While other gangs had been making money smuggling over the years, the Purples made greater profit by hijacking their loads. The gang's stolen loads were transferred to a cutting plant where they operated. One bottle of bonded Canadian whiskey cut with water and coloring yielded three bottles for sale and distribution through their network. Oof. Ugh, can you imagine? (laughs) Sounds disgusting. That just made me so sad. I know. That's just a disgrace to alcohol. Don't ruin the alcohols. (laughs) (laughs) It's a party foul all the way. Yeah. Truck drivers were often killed on the spot. The Purples may have received immunity over the years from police, but that didn't stop the FBI, who was hot on their trail. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover obtained files that included written letters to the uh, Bureau offering evidence to the murder, kidnappings, and bootlegging, and was continuously investigating tips on the whereabouts of the gang. Abe Bernstein knew their time was almost up, so he gave all the Purple Gang's lucrative operations to the Italians. In return, he received 
a mafia-funded pension for himself that lasted until his death in 1968. Oh, my God. Can you believe it? Oh, my God. I seriously was losing my shit when I was reading this. This is just a crazy story. <laughs> I know. Um, this is one of the only peaceful inner gang transfers of power in mob history. The Purple Gang may not have been in power for long, but it's estimated that they killed over 500 members of rival bootlegging gangs during the time of operation. That's a lot of people. I know. That is a <laughs> lot of people. Yeah. And they just got away with it all. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, up until, you know, where they actually, but like, that's just, that's and nuts. And then to hand over your gang and all operations yeah. to somebody else. Oh it's, my gosh. That was a really good story. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. I liked that one a lot. Me too. That was a lot of fun. I liked that one. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I hope you guys were as excited about it as we were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that it didn't get too confusing with all the names. Uh, but it's important to have in there because this is history. That's true. And it was fun. And there were some names I did recognize in there. So Absolutely. I liked that. Me too. I mean, I, of course, most people probably recognized Al Capone, but like there were so many names in there that I actually knew. So. Yeah. Same. That I've at least heard of. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe not know, you know, too much about them, but I've definitely heard of the names. Yeah. So I thought that was a really good one. Mm hmm. So thanks for drinking the Kool Aid with us. Um, like us on Facebook and also subscribe. On your podcast app, please, pretty please. We would love that. We really appreciate all and the support. If you subscribe, it will tell you when we put on a new episode. Exactly. So it's very important. Then you'll know and you don't have to ask us. Although you still can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you totally don't have can. To. Yeah. Uh, and if for some reason you're listening to this and you're not sure how to subscribe on your app, you can ask us on our Facebook page and we'll see what we can do to help. Absolutely. So that's all we have for you. Um, bye. bye. Like four cart full. Oh my God. I'm going to pause that for a sec. Four cart full. <laughs> what the fuck? Four carts full there. <laughs> Jeez, okay. So we bought like four carts full of pick. <sighs> <laughs> what did we buy? I got it. I got this. Okay. In 1920, prohibition took effect throughout the United States. What? <laughs> United States? <laughs> With those, uh, those cartfuls. Uh... <laughs> Okay, back that up. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. I haven't even gotten through the first sentence. <laughs> okay. It's so hot in here. <laughs> okay. It's like a sauna. We're tripping, dude. Oh, this is so bad. I feel so comfortable. <laughs> okay, okay. Are we ready? This is so stupid. Oh, my cheeks hurt. You almost have to like put that at the beginning. It's so hot in here. It's like a sauna. <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. Okay. Okay, we good? If I don't melt. <laughs> okay. Stop. Stop laughing. Oh, sorry. Thank you. God. All right.